2023 was an incredibly memorable year in terms of achieving my lifelong dream traveling the entire world. During this year, I ventured into countries from various continents, some of which I couldn't even spell until I got there. And I also reflected on some past trips that were incredibly important in my life. In this video, I'm gonna condense this unforgettable year into a single video. So wait till the end to get some surprising life lessons while discovering our extraordinary world. Let's start this journey in Uzbekistan. Situated in Central Asia, this country was a real treasure trove of rich history, stunning architecture, and warm hospitality. Oh, and did I mention delicious food? Country number 153, Uzbekistan. Two hours on the border, finally made it. One, five, three. Today's Friday, I'll come and pray in the Juma prayer here in the Minor Mosque, which is one of the more beautiful mosques in Tashkent, and frankly, in Uzbekistan. That's probably the largest Jum'ah prayer I've ever seen or ever been a part of. It's hot, so I needed another ice cream. Way too hot out there. So this is a madrasa, a center of learning, which was super important in Islamic times and has persisted throughout. In fact, it turns out that Uzbekistan has almost a 99% literacy rate. So Kiev is known for its artisanship and wood carving craft here in the city. And there's no better example than this mosque, which is held up by about 218 wooden pillars that really kind of showcases the beautiful wood carvings that these artisans are able to create. <laughs> Okay, I'm here with my boy Merji, who I recently met in Tashkent and is going to be taking me hopefully to Samarkand. Um, and he brought us to a restaurant that's known to have the best pilaf in all of Central Asia, which is a huge statement since everybody in, in Central Asia loves pilaf. But I'm gonna show you how cool this crazy kitchen is and how they actually prepare the pilaf. Now imagine during the holidays, this is what they would be using. So this takes about oh, almost a month, month about one month work, one month work to consistently work here on these things. How cool is this guy giving me a lift right to the main area of Samarkand? Place I'm staying in with that incredible background behind you of Bibi Khanem Mosque. Now, for the question we always ask everyone, why should people come to Uzbekistan? Because of tasty food, shashliks, uh, shorba, and etc. Because of good music, dancing, and our um, history. Amazing. And hospitality, of And course. hospitality, of course. You heard it first. Come visit Uzbekistan. I did not expect much from Tajikistan before I visited, but by the time I left, it became one of my favorite countries in Central Asia. This has so much to do with the landscape, history, and the people who will go to great lengths to welcome you. Today, we're in Tushambi, Tajikistan, exploring all that this amazing city has on offer and seeing all the nationalism of this country. The red color means the bravery of Tajik people in history. Mm -hmm. The white color means the bright future. And the green one means prosperity of Tajik people. I had no idea this existed. Oh, and it even gets better. They've got four banquet halls. Let's check out what this one looks like. I'm almost too scared to look. Wow. Wow, look at this. Just look at that. And the whole idea is that it was built by Tajiks, Tajik money, Tajik financing, Tajik artisans built it all, handcrafted doors. I think she said it was like red walnut or something to that effect. Every single freaking nut you've ever imagined. I actually started developing an appetite and want to try the famous Korotub dish. Let me tell you, this meal packs one hell of a punch. And so I asked my friend, what's the best place? And you'll know it's a damn good place 
when the locals are there and know it well and there's like almost no foreigners. So I'm gonna show you how cool this place is and how crazy this meal is. Uh, this is Kuruto, Tajik national food made of chaka, white one. It's in Western you call it yogurt, but it's not yogurt. It's kind of yogurt, but Tajik kind. Warm, a certain kind of fermented yogurt with these vegetables, and really good meat. When I got to the monument, they were in the midst of preparations for the upcoming Independence Day from the Soviet Union on September 7th, and were actually preparing for the unveiling of the monument and adjacent park. This was an experience in and of itself, since there were several thousand people rehearsing in unison all over the square to hyper-nationalistic Tajik music. Right over there, you're gonna see part of the dam structure. Where they're releasing water. So going to the area down into the lake. The dam itself, which is the second highest in the world, is over there. They produce so much electricity that they're able to export it. Unreal. We're heading to Iskandarku Lake okay. from Dushanbe and it's gonna take us uh, roughly it's about three hours. All right, this is meant to be one of the most dangerous, if not the most dangerous tunnel in the world. Let's see how it is. Along the route, we had to drive over high mountain passes and go through all kinds of tunnels, including a Staklal tunnel, also known as the Tunnel of Death. Constructed in cooperation with Iran in 2006, the five kilometer tunnel at 2,700 meters of elevation on the famous M34 highway had poor lighting, no ventilation, potholes, and occasional flooding, and therefore caused drivers all sorts of issues, resulting in numerous accidents and deaths. We finally got to Iskandar Kul a large, expansive glacier lake which got its name from Alexander the Great who fought the local tribes there. And while the lake was nice, I have to say I was even more impressed by the nearby waterfall, a short hike away, which is definitely worth visiting. So walking through that patch of green, and suddenly you come on this. They're cooling their drinks from water that's coming from the springs in the mountains above. How awesome is that? We have to put stones to weigh it down as we go off-roading to get to Seven Lakes, which is about 30 kilometers away. Nestled deep in the mountains, the ride to the lake is not for the faint of heart. I mean, I breathed enough dust and got splitting headaches from how bumpy and frankly treacherous it was in parts. But when we finally started to see the cascading lakes about three to five miles apart, I realized that often you have to go through hell to get to heaven. And they were gorgeous, each lake unique in its own right. We actually stopped at Lake 6 and decided to hike up to Lake 7. And once we got there, I walked along the lake shore until I reached the end, where there was a little village and I met some locals. Local villagers hanging out here. After you walk all that way, you get to that little village. Say hello. Salam. It was magical. I would definitely recommend the hike. In fact, I have to say, it was the highlight of my trip to Tajikistan. Capo Verde, located off the northwest coast of Africa in the Atlantic Ocean, is known for its varied landscape and vibrant culture. But what really brought me to these incredible islands was the Morna music of Cesano Avora. Cape Verde, country number 154, in the beautiful airport on the island of What South makes Cabo Verde so interesting when it comes to music is, you know, the, the entire history of Cabo Verde is really this tragic story of a place that was populated by and was, you know, its entire history is deeply embedded in the visceral tragedy of slavery. Between that and the fact that its history is nothing but almost unending struggle all the way into the 20th century, what you have is this rare moment where, sure, lots of places have music, but with Cape Verde, if you really want to peer into the soul of Cape Verde, the only way to do that is to understand its music. And the reason I'm here in Mindaloa is so that I can find where that incredible woman was born and lived, Cesaria Vora, the queen of Morna music. Excited to do a run in this beautiful little island here in Cape Verde and see what it has to offer at sunrise. 
I came across the house of exactly the person I really came to Cape Verde to see, which is the famous barefoot diva or Cesaria Aurora. And you can see her right there. She lived there from 1975, which is when Cape Verde got its independence from Portugal until 1991. Really, it was in the late 80s and 90s when she had her breakout role and albums came out and so forth, and she really became a global sensation. So really, really serendipitous to come across her house right here, like very close to where I'm staying. Let's go check out this incredible museum, see what it has to offer. Now what was incredible about her story is that she lived such a difficult life, left behind by her parents and had to sing in dive bars to make a living in Mindelo. She was only discovered later in her career, very reminiscent to the life of the phenomenal French singer, Edith Piaf. The history of this country is a history built literally on slavery. Portuguese came here in the 1460s or so, found this island which is completely uninhabited, and then as a slave trade continued, they needed a place to stop to be able to effectively reload and resupply. And that is exactly what Cape Verde Serving is. It was essentially a pit stop for people, or for slave traders taking people across the Atlantic. So think about that. It's a country built on the backs of slavery. And a lot of the people here you see which are an amalgamation of Europeans and West Africans, are a vestige of that era. And then they created their own culture. So the type of music Patuk is more percussion? Percussion? Is a frog with the, the women's play in a, something like, like a tissue in the middle of the, the legs. legs. They make, a, they call this, this instrument a chabeta. So as you can tell, this is a crater. And it apparently has the most biodiversity of any location in the Cape Verdean Islands. It is absolutely amazing. And we are so, so lucky because it rained, which means that the area is so green. Typically, it's a little drier down there, but as you can see, it is just absolutely incredible. This is Vera, has a beautiful little kiosk overlooking the Kova. We were literally recommended to come find her so she can make a famous breakfast. Good cut. <laughs> and it's a hearty meal that I am almost sure probably will keep us full all the way to like the late afternoon. We then made our way through the countryside, stopping to hike and take in all the beautiful landscape made up of mountains, ravines, and even waterfalls. Such an unreal background and so different from San Vicente. Where am I? In Portugal or in Cape Verde? Portugal or Cape Verde? Belém Tower. So you fisherman? Yeah, tuna. Okay. But I'm so many friends from uh, your country been here before to work in a ship from the cow ship come to Uruguay, Uruguay to Cape Verde, Cape Verde to your country. <laughs> Are you happy here? Very good time. Yeah, very good time. From a vacation or from job? Vacation. A vacation. Do you have such time? Yes. You like it? Very much. Welcome to Cape Verde. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Jump in and try to see some turtles. Apparently that's all the rage in South Pedro at the end of the island near the airport. Let's go check it out. Well, I have to say that moment, jumping into the water was likely the highlight of my entire trip. It was, how can I say, just breathtaking to be surrounded by these turtles swimming all around us, bumping into us. We even saw manta rays. It was, it was as if we were part of a single ecosystem and it really reminded me of Avatar 2. And now here's the crazy part. We forgot our GoPro, so we ended up jumping into the ocean with our iPhone that didn't even have a waterproof cover to capture these beautiful creatures. Well, the iPhone survived, almost, but at least we had these incredible visual memories to share with you. Wow. Wow, that was great. I even like grabbed one and started pulling on it. You can see the right there. We just saw some incredible, incredible turtles, maybe five, six, seven turtles. And we even saw two stingrays, little tiny barracudas, clownfish, 
Over here in beautiful Cape Verde. Unbelievable. Cabo Verde has more to offer than most places I've ever been to, and it all centers around the eclectic nature of the islands, the rich varied culture, and the generosity of the people, which in turn informs their music and of course their kindness. I so look forward to coming back to explore even more of the islands while enjoying the music and the morabeza of the Cabo Verdean people. I've met many Samoans in my life and was eager to visit the island paradise in the heart of the South Pacific. With its lush rainforests, waterfalls, pristine beaches, and vibrant Polynesian culture, Samoa truly lived up to its reputation. Landed in Samoa and Apia right here, country 155. What did it achieve? This journey, we're in the beautiful island of Samoa in the South Pacific, checking out all the beautiful nature, meeting the awesome people, and checking out the vibes and all that this island has on offer right in the middle of the West. In the capital, season. I found a very large and elaborate church, which I had to stop and explore. So this church called the Immaculate Conception right here in the center of Apia, and it's an absolutely huge, huge church right here in the center of town that only serves to kind of reemphasize the point that Samoans are incredibly religious, incredibly faithful to uh, Christianity primarily and other faith and denominations here on the island. While walking around the capital, I kept noticing Samoans wearing these really cool skirts, which I discovered later were called Lava Lava. Now, I'm not gonna lie, it felt like a major contradiction in terms. Samoans are big, strong people, like really big people, almost intimidating. But seeing them sport the Lava Lava somehow makes the people, especially the men, more approachable. So I had to try one out to see what it's all about, and man, are these things comfortable. This is gonna be the new way that we're gonna start traveling. One thing that really grabbed my attention about Samoan people is their love for intricate tattoos. I mean, just look at the amazing tattoos on one of my favorite actors, The Rock, who is partly Samoan. So I did some research, asked around, and was told that tattoo ceremonies, which are incredibly intricate, protracted, and elaborate affairs, take place every day in a specific location right in the capital. So the tattoo ceremony is a very, very important part of Samoan culture. And what it is, it involves a group of people tattooing an individual over the course of a week or two. Sometimes it takes even longer. And they use very provincial tools that they've been doing for thousands of years, bones, wood, uh, and tapping it into the part of the body where for men it starts kind of like right at the belly button and just above the belly button all the way down to the kneecaps and it involves a group of people someone uh, holding the arm and providing comfort to the person who's getting the tattoo to the person who's providing kava uh, a drink that provides a little numbingness and so forth and comfort as you go through the process as well as a group of people who are covering and collecting and cleaning up the blood and the ink as well as the people that are providing the actual tattoo and those are artists that really takes a lot of time to kind of you know perfect that process all right now we're having oka which is another samoan delicacy cucumbers rawfish and coconut hopefully it doesn't do a number on my stomach because i'm not used to eating all of this i imagine it's a little bit like ceviche mm, and spicy too all right in the it. middle of this awesome market flea the new flea market on the other side of town I just discovered that they take coconut shells, smoke them so that you can actually use it as charcoal for your barbecue. How cool is that? After shopping and sampling, eating and shopping and sampling some more, I caught the eye of a man in a wheelchair selling exotic fruit. I sat with him for a little while to hear about his background, his story, and his People perspective. They love to travel uh, and visit to Samoan because the their culture respects uh, people. They respect all uh, people, whatever kind of people they came, they always respect them. And uh, Samoa, our culture is wrapped up with, with love and care and uh, hospitality. Many people, uh, they come to Samoa, they try to taste their local fruits and uh, local uh, fish and uh, everything here in Samoa because Samoa is a beautiful uh, country here in the Pacific. I decided to use the rest of my time in Samoa to really get immersed in another side of the country, namely its natural beauty on the main island. And how do you pronounce this place? Papai Tai. Papai Tai waterfall. waterfall. We just found it right in the middle of all these weeds right here. It's the first time that he's seen it and I've seen it. We then went to a very unique location on the main island, the famous Ocean Trench. So one of the really cool things to do here in Samoa as part of kind of like seeing and exploring nature is the Tusua 
trench, which is essentially called a giant swimming hole. That's what it really means in local uh, Samoan. And what it is, it's part of a lava tube system that collapsed and connects it to the ocean. So it got filled with water over time. What it really reminds me of is the cenotes in, uh, in the Mayan Peninsula, where you can kind of connect these incredible watering holes between different places. The same thing you'll see with this beautiful place. So now let's go check it out and maybe even jump in. Whoa! Such a cool natural phenomenon and a really fun place to hang out. Lucky for us, the rain drove away the tourists, so we had it all to ourselves. Spread, spread, spread. Woo! So right here, we're in the Alofaga blowholes right here on the island of Savai. And they're crazy because what you have is all this lava on the floor and boom, right behind you, you can see that the water, when it crashes against the lava, just goes right through the cracks and then blows up right behind you. It's pretty intense. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna put a coconut on one of these holes, see how high it flies and see if it can crack when it lands. You got it? Watch out. Whoa. There it is. There it is. Whoa. We've got chop suey, as you can see. We got curry. We got fried chicken. And we got fried fish right over there. I also learned another term, agia, which means family, and how much I appreciated feeling like I was a part of his. I also reflected back on that moment in the market with the man on the wheelchair. I remember at the end of the conversation, he slowly leaned in and asked me quietly if he could have my cap in return for his. Now, don't get me wrong, I loved my cap, but something told me to just do it. It was the least I could do. So we exchanged hats and I left him satisfied with a smile. Beautiful people, beautiful stories, were really remarkable. That guy had been through a lot. His poor son had passed away from COVID and he was paralyzed and so, it only made sense that we traded something so we can remember each other. Really awesome. Lesbos Island was a throwback from 2017, which I was inspired to relive given the release of the movie, The Swimmers, on Netflix. It was such a bittersweet experience exploring Lesbos while helping the refugees on the island at a time of real global turmoil. In 2015, there were over a million refugees that crossed into Europe from different parts of Asia, the Middle East, and Africa. And in the small island of Lesbos, which is just off the coast of Turkey, 10,000 people would cross almost every single day during that year to seek refuge into Greece and then cross from Greece into Europe. So that brings us to spring 2017. Now I was in graduate school and a few of my colleagues organized a service trek to the island of Lesbos to do our part. We were only there a week, but the goal was to give hope to these refugees that were in many cases stranded in camps on the island and to new refugees that may potentially be arriving on the island. There were 30 of us volunteers that traveled to Lesbos, an island that really usually only has about 80,000 inhabitants. But during the crisis, the island expanded almost five times its size in terms of trying to accommodate for the refugees that came across from Turkey. Now, as one of several Arabic speakers on the trip, and as an immigrant myself, I felt a close connection with a lot of the refugees, predominantly led by Syrians at the time. I think one of the most memorable things I did was really uh, working with a couple of people to, uh, to teach the children to swim. And it was an unreal experience, like the difference of life and death during the journey, and now they were just splashing around the water and trying to enjoy it. It's just a juxtaposition that was really, really heartfelt. And we also practiced uh, what we would do if a boat arrived and how we would get them offshore and, uh, uh, and into safety. Uh, and I remember working with Sada and, and her, her co-leaders like uh, Nassos and Sean and so forth, who really inspired us because what they were doing was just remarkable. They had given up so much of their lives to come out there and work with these people uh, and had choices to do it, but decided to really put it all aside. Um, and it gave us a sense of, of gratitude, you know, like it was just an unbelievable experience to work with these people to serve refugees. Um, and just, I was thankful uh, to be able to do, you know, what little part I had. I have to say that one of the most powerful experiences though on the trip was seeing something called the Life Jacket Graveyard. So one of the days, uh, a few of us like decided to drive around the island. We took the car, went around the island because we'd heard about this Life Jacket Graveyard, but we didn't believe it and we just drove around for several hours going down dead-end streets, little 
towns. We just kind of circumvented almost the whole island to see it. And then suddenly we went over a hill. And as we went over this crest of a hill, um, we could see nothing but just discarded life jackets. It was like a hollowed ground before us, like just thousands of these life jackets, little teddy bears, clothes, shoes, hats. I mean, you name it, bags. I mean, everything was just kind of thrown there, broken boats, um, just discarded like a graveyard, literally. There was really nothing short of, of a apocalyptic. Camp Moira, which is one of the main camps there, burned to the ground in 2022. And while the refugees in Lesbos have become just a trickle, uh, the refugee crisis still exists in Europe. Hundreds of thousands still try to cross, and many, many don't make it across the Mediterranean to seek a new life in Europe. Now look, I have to say that I really hope that the legal system will exonerate Sada and her co-defendant by recognizing the nobility of what she was trying to do, that even though one can throw the book on her, as a lawyer, I can say myself that, you know, uh, her actions, they were expedient to try to serve a more humane purpose. And that purpose is far from a crime. And despite these sad realities for me, that service trek was just a reminder that you always have to give it back. Give it back as often as you can, even if you're traveling, even if it's just for leisure, because it really was a heartfelt experience and watching that movie Swimmers brought it all back to me. Now I concluded that article that I wrote back in grad school with the following sentiments to really encourage public service. Teach, volunteer, run for office, or whatever service you choose, no matter whether you win or lose, reach a broad audience or only a few friends, save one life or many, Action in the service of others can inspire hope, purpose, and benevolent action that is critical in a world of constant struggle and turmoil. Despite the devastation of the volcanic eruption in 2022, Tonga, a Polynesian island chain in the South Pacific, was a paradise and the resilience of its ancient people was awe-inspiring. All right, here we are in Tonga, country 156. Let's go see the South Pacific Island and see what it has on offer. Mm. So I'm taking a cab from the airport and I'm sitting with Sioni. So on Sunday, you guys wake up and do what? Yeah, wake up and uh, do the umu, going to the church. And then you come back? Yeah, come back, have a lunch. With the family, huh? Yeah, with the family. I am on a mission to try to find a car that I can rent because all the rental places are closed uh, now and Sunday, everything's closed in town. Uh, and I really want a car tomorrow so I can see the, the island, uh, the main island. So this is one of the main busy thoroughfares here in the capital in Tonga and Nuku Alofa. Basically, it's usually bump in businesses and so forth. But on Sundays, it's literally illegal to have any commerce in the city. So no gas stations, no basically uh, shops, supermarkets, restaurants, cafes, everything has to be closed. So it's eerie quiet here because everyone's at church. And then after that, they'll be kicking it with their families, having what they call a umo. And then they basically break bread with their family and then just kind of relax. They don't do anything. It's, it's the tradition here. And as I said, it's almost government enforced. So nobody messes with it. I was told that one of the best things to experience on a Sunday in Tonga is a traditional umu, which is an underground oven pit that is used to bake large meals for big gatherings. This place was in the middle of nowhere. And even though it was super crowded and waiting at the buffet line took a long time, the backdrop was unreal and the service fantastic. I started the post umu journey with a stop at the blowholes. Now the ones I had just seen in Samoa, in Savai, were mind blowing. But honestly, these were super cool too. And the whole area felt prehistoric, almost Jurassic. I then stumbled on this awesome mini lagoon that had a reef with blowholes at a distance so that each time a wave hit that natural rock barrier, it would erupt in sequence. I felt almost like a conductor of nature. Elvis here in one of the best cafes in Tonga, in Friends Cafe, and he's gonna tell you why you should come to Tonga. Why should you come to Tonga, Elvis? To come to Tonga because the uh, beautiful and um, food and everything is Tonga is beautiful. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank Elvis. You. <laughs> On January 15th, 2022, the Tonga Hanga Hapai submarine volcano erupted to the north of the main island. It was the largest eruption ever recorded, hundreds of times more powerful than an atomic bomb. Its sound was heard 6,000 miles away in Alaska and had hurricane speed winds recorded at the edge of space. 
the waves that were unleashed were truly apocalyptic. You can just see, like it just looks like uh, no man's land out here, just destruction. Uh, trees uprooted and ripped apart, homes ex you know, exposed and destroyed, um, and it's taken a long time to rebuild it. But despite feeling like a sense of hopelessness because of the constant natural struggles, I think Tonga is one of the countries that's super vulnerable to climactic changes and the destruction brought by it. I think the people are strong. I mean, they really want to push through and rebuild and stand strong. Um, and nature has a way of rebuilding itself too. It's, it's really an incredible uh, experience. I'm super glad I was able to find a boat, take me out here to see the guys who run this, uh, this, the small little bar and resort. During the tsunami, we had our friends and family over. Yeah. Just for a swim, casual time. And out of nowhere, smoke started to build up to the far side. And then we're just standing and watching it like we don't know what's going on. It's like brand new for us. After after the bang, it scares us pretty bad. We have a few options by go by boat or go up to land. And my mom took the whole family and friends up to the land and somehow we survived that. It wasn't a big tsunami, but we were lucky, but not for Tonga. After touring the island, I connected with a couple, one who was originally from Tonga, and together they pushed me to climb up and jump off the shipwreck. Now, anyone who knows me knows I hate jumping off heights, but I wanted to push past my fears and limits, so I just did it. And as if things couldn't get any crazier, en route back to the ship, I almost bumped into a black and white sea snake, one of the most venomous in the world. Avoiding death, I slowly climbed back up again and... Woo! In the process, I also met locals and saw why they indeed lived up to their namesake as the friendly islands. Their generosity, trust, pride, and the incredible resilience is why they were able to remain steadfast in the face of disaster. Another throwback experience was my climb up Kilimanjaro, the roof of Africa. What makes this experience magical is the different climates you see along the way. When we summited and saw the sunrise above the clouds, it was one of the most emotionally moving experiences of my life. Now, almost 10 years ago, I decided to do something I had no idea if I was capable of doing, and that is climbing the roof of Africa. We just said, let's do it. And that's really how this whole spontaneous adventure started. Now, what makes Kilimanjaro so unique is it literally has five different climates. And because of all the different climates, it was just never boring. So the first climate that we went through is called the cultivation zone, which is kind of more between zero meters and I think 1800 meters. You kind of travel through little towns, the savanna agricultural lands, and it basically we drove up to about 1800 meters where the trail starts. Once you get there, you start at kind of the rainforest, and that's really where Kilimanjaro, the trek starts. And it's a whole new climate. And I'm not lying to you when I say that it really felt like a rainforest in Africa. So the next day we woke up early and we were going to start wandering through what is called the moorland, which is And the for next. me, I suddenly started to surge. Me and my friend Heather, we started to surge and went way ahead of everyone. Uh, within the first second day, we were like two, three hours ahead of everybody to the point that our guides kept saying pole pole to kind of slow us down, but I don't know. I guess I was just so amped and excited to keep pressing ahead and trying to get to the, uh, to the camp as soon as possible in some ways. And I think it helped us because when we got to the camp, we got two to three hours earlier than everyone else. And I think that really allowed us to kind of rest even more than other folks, eat better uh, and sleep earlier. By day four, the headaches started to kick in, but thankfully we had started acclimating as well. And so it wasn't as bad as it could have been. Now, the environment was what they call Highland Alpine Desert, and it felt like something like Mars meets Mad Max. Truly desert, no animals, just barren rock with, you know, it's very inhospitable territory. And sadly, at this point, uh, one of the people in the group was suffering so badly from altitude sickness, I think he was getting uh, pulmonary edema, and so they had to take him back down, which was a freaking nightmare for the folks there that were helping us up. Uh, but it was like fatigue, nausea. And look, the uh, porters, the Tanzanian porters made the experience so, so amazing. And they just kept pushing us, you know, and encouraging us and supporting us and ensuring our safety. This is the song that they basically sing uh, to kind of pump you up and motivate you. Jambo, Jambo, Bawana Habri. I can't remember that, how the song went, but I'd probably butcher it. But I remember it finishes with Akuna Matata, which obviously always used to make me laugh.
So now it was up to the last day and we had gone so far and everything was riding on this day. So we woke up at 1 a.m. as I said, and it was really cold and windy. I had this bakalava that I had on my face, trying to keep as warm as possible. We all lined up almost like in a chain gang, slowly ascending, but then suddenly I was like, I can't. I've got to just keep pushing ahead. And so I put on some really good music and then just step by step, just push through, push through, push through to try to get to the top, especially by sunrise, which was really, really the goal. And we got this area called the Arctic Summit Zone, which is kind of like the last zones as if Africa meets the Arctic. Just a completely different ambiance. And the temperature dropped as like sub-zero temperatures. As I was pushing up there, the porter said, listen, if you push hard and you run now, you can be literally the first person on the top of the mountain that day. And for whatever reason, I have no idea where the energy came and I just gunned it, ran for my life at that altitude, almost 6,000 meters, right to the summit. And it was just pure and utter magic. As we turned around, you could see the glacier, the crater, and the clouds all below you with the sun slowly rising. We got there like around 6 a.m. and it was, it was just pure magic, bliss and humbling. Like you could just imagine the power of God and the power of nature to kind of humble you and show you this incredible, incredible moment. And with those sentiments in mind, and for some reason spontaneously, we decided to pray right there and then. We just kind of fell to our knees and it turned out that our porter uh, his name was Moses, was also Muslim. So we were all uh, praying together in unison, overlooking the horizon. The light that we saw as we lined up to pray was unbelievable. It's like watching a movie with my own eyes. I couldn't believe it. It was just pure magic. It was one of the greatest experiences in my life uh, in terms of travel, I have to say. It was just unbelievably emotional. I spent many years of my childhood in Egypt, and on a recent trip decided to visit the ancient city of Luxor. Even though we only had 36 hours, we saw so much. The city in the heart of Egypt is a living museum, adorned with ancient temples, tombs, and the majestic Nile cutting right through the city. Spent the last two hours trying to negotiate and find a good tour and also see if I can get a balloon tour in the morning. So the Winter Palace right here on the banks of the Nile was created in the late 1800s by the Khedive of Egypt and has hosted all sorts of dignitaries for many, many, many years. Um, and now is a hotel that is run by Sofitel. The real beauty, definitely worth seeing when you're in Luxor just because of its historical significance of this beautiful part of Luxor. And I am wearing a fez just to be as orientalist as possible. So riding in a felucca is like a dream. It's like floating in a cloud, no engine. You're just going off the wind, off the beautiful Nile. Right here, we're doing it in Luxor. Absolutely gorgeous. First time in a hot air balloon, and what better place than it looks like? You're seeing the Valley of the Kings in the distance. You're seeing the Nile, you're seeing the temples. Uh, just a beautiful, beautiful way of seeing uh, Luxor and honestly, very, very affordable. Definitely, if you've never done it before, I highly, highly recommend that you do that. We landed with the balloon, which is crazy because balloons don't have like a guiding system. They go by uh, air currents and wind currents and so forth. Uh, but we landed kind of in a field. They took us over to a minibus to our, where we had our guide waiting for us, who was simply awesome. Wow, what a trip, what an experience. I'm not gonna lie, I didn't think I was scared of heights. I am scared of heights. Balloons are still way up there, you can see, but man, that is no joke. I think we had almost a thousand feet up there. But what a beautiful way to see a credible city like Luxor. They used different types of rocks that they ground down to create the different colors. Yellow, for example, though, was an egg yolk. Or the green was malachite that was ground down, alabaster, and other incredible things like that. Unbelievable. Karnak Temple the largest outdoor temple, really archeological site in the world, 60 acres. This place is unreal. Built over 2000 years, constantly being built over and over and over time by different pharaohs to pay respect to the gods over here on the east bank of Luxor. Budapest is the jewel in Central Europe, where history and modernity converge. I went with my family to the Hungarian capital on the banks of the Danube River, which is known for its architecture, hundreds of thermal baths, and vibrant culture. 
many little sculptures that you can find all over the city. Right here in one of the nice walking areas. Grand climbing behind me. Poor lady. She's the only one that's curious enough to go see everything I want to see. Now at the top of the hill you'll find a statue that was erected by the Soviets in 1947 to commemorate the liberation of the city from the Nazis. All right, made it to the top. You can see some of the down area. Budapest down here and the bridges. Really, really beautiful. Great, great view, really worth it. A little bit of a waterfall on the bottom of that hill. Really, really cool. Let's check out if it actually is the most beautiful cafe Absolutely beautiful. I don't know if it's the most beautiful or fabulous in the world, but it's definitely up there. And it's in the New York Palace Hotel, right in the center of Budapest. Definitely, if you're coming to Budapest, check it out. So I'm about to show you an amazing, amazing dessert. You gotta check this out. Of course, my family ate all of it. Check it out. Whoa, get away from me. Stop it. Always be training. Budapest, six mile training run. This little guy behind me right in front of the iconic parliament of Budapest and Hungary. Sightseeing, and that's the opera house. And this is one of the main streets of Budapest. Man, look how small these places are. It's like hiding in all kinds of spots. So right now we're in Fisherman's Bastion, which is really a homage to the seven tribes. From each tribe they have these turnets right there. You can see three kind of right behind me. And each one symbolizes the seven tribes that essentially helped conquer the country and establish modern day so Hungary. So this castle is a, a kind of a place where all the architectural styles of Hungary kind of come together, Romanesque, Gothic, Renaissance type of architecture, all came into one location. A really, really nice place. Chilling here with the Fam Bam, who are obviously killing the statue over there, I don't know why. But uh, really, really nice place, definitely worth a visit. So this is the outdoor bath in the Gillerit, right here near just kind of the outskirts of center of Budapest. There's a couple of baths around. This is like a huge tradition here. And a great way to end the day on a beautiful Danube cruise right through the city to see all the beautiful lights. Mongolia is a unique blend of untamed natural beauty and rich cultural history. And to think that the Mongols under Genghis Khan and his sons control 20% of the known world is simply mind-boggling. On this incredible journey, we are in the magnificent country of Mongolia, checking out everything that this country has on offer, including riding these beautiful camels, and this guy's fur is beautiful, and checking out the statue of Genghis Khan, the most famous man of these incredible lands. All right, I'm here with my boy Maga. Not that kind of Maga. <laughs> How do you pronounce your name? Mig Marjov. That's Mig Marjov, there you go. So tell me, Maga, what are these, what are we looking at? These kind of camels, what are they? They are Mongolian Bec Bectrin camels. Okay, and then you're saying that the top of the camel, the humps, the double hump, is made out of what? It's fat, yeah. Okay. I thought Mongolians are crazy. <laughs> All right, woke up at sunrise to see the beautiful white stupa overlooking the whole Golby Steppe with this crazy guy. So tell me, why should people come to Mongolia? It's such an underrated country, I think, because it's so remote from the uh, rest of the world. It exactly lies at the heart of uh, Asia and the culture, the people, the nomadic lifestyle, the marine corps, the music, nature. We have the south, in the south we have Gobi Desert, in the north we have the Tera Ate Mountains, Hanga Mountains. The nature is just amazing. So this is Tedlidge National Park and as you can see it is unbelievable. It's like a huge valley kind of that extends 20-30 kilometers in this direction you can see over here, there's just, this almost feels endless. And it is absolutely stunning. What you see here is like yurts or gears as they call them here and hotels and resorts. And so people from Ulaanbaatar come out here for the weekend and really enjoy it. And it is just stunning, unbelievable. 
What is fascinating about the country is that one third of the population is still nomadic or semi-nomadic, packing their camps each season and roaming the never-ending expanse of Mongolia. Whether they are in the deserts, steppes, grasslands, or high mountains, they are always roaming and have done so for centuries. So right there, you guys can see there are some of the Prolowski horses. These horses have two extra chromosomes than a regular horse, and they're the truly the most, probably the only wild horse, really, in existence. They were almost extinct, and then they reintroduced them to this exact park. So this is the only place in the world that you can actually find them. You can see them there just grazing, but they're super protected. Epic. There they are. Got them. Got them. They're all chilling. Even though most of these tourist villages tend to be very gimmicky, for some reason, Mongol nomads struck a chord with me. They showed so many facets of Mongolian life, in terms of how they live, eat and drink off the land, their companion animals, the way they migrate, and the music. Above all, the music. Just listen to the throat singing that is one of the oldest forms of music and has originated from Mongolia and the surrounding region. So this is cow milk that's fermented right in there. And then it's distilled right in here. They use dung to fire up this bad boy right in there. And then in the end, you can see it, that's all poop. That fires it up, talk about recyclable, perfect. And then it ends up looking like that. Oh. So behind me is the Mongolian parliament and they're expanding it from 76 seats to 126 so they can have more diversity in the parliament. Younger people, people uh, with physical challenges, people with um, diverse backgrounds, right? So they're trying to really expand it so they can create even more egalitarian systems within this very new nascent democracy here in Mongolia. And right there, in terms of nascence, you've got the historical figure of Genghis Khan kind of sitting overlooking the throne and overlooking the city. So really, really poignant in terms of kind of where uh, they were and where they want to go. Oman and the Arabian Peninsula is said to be one of the most unique countries in the Middle East in terms of its landscape and natural beauty. On this journey, we drove deep into the mountains and even had a chance to experience the Via Farata. All right, I'm with this guy eating papaya, you said? Sabane. Yep, right here on the border with Oman. We are going to go explore and do some fun stuff and share it with you. Ready, bro? Let's go. <laughs> These dates are packed with energy and sugar, and I'm starving. So hopefully this will carry us through the day. No, no shortcut today. No shortcut today. Yes. We're maximizing it. All right. Show them how you do it. Front and back. Front and back. So this is one back and this is one front. Good. For safety purposes. Go. Front back. Front back. Front back. Front back. Front back. Front back. Show, show, show them your love. Show them how it's all tied up together. Perfect. That's how you climb. And we got orange for final 50 right there on my head. You ready, Chief? We were determined to take full advantage of the experience, given the hefty price tag that costs us a few hundred dollars. So we suited up and got ready for the climb. Now, the whole idea of the Via Ferrata, or the Iron Way in Italian, is to allow people to access nearly impossible ledges, vertical walls, and mountain peaks with the help of steel cables, ladders, and other fixed anchors. Now, it's been around for, oh, I don't know, about a hundred years, but it is only now becoming all the rage around the world, including in Oman. Our climb was technically difficult, but since we did it slowly, and our guide was awesome, it was not that bad. But I definitely got the shakes when I tried to stretch out my arms at the top of the mountain with no support. Here we All go. Right. Yeah, good job. Down there is the village, it's one of the ancient villages of the mountain. It's absolutely beautiful. All right, where are we, bro? We're in Saguara. Saguara, an ancient city that's still inhabited by residents, you can see behind us. And we've got, what, pomegranate trees down there? Really well preserved, right here deep in the mountains in Oman. So we're gonna go down and explore. Last stop of the day, didn't realize the sun sets here at 6.15. I wanna show you guys the last part of this beautiful Jabal al Akhdar, which is an old, old town. Actually the oldest part of this mountain in terms of a town. It's about 2,000 years old, crazy. Thunder in the distance, cool mountain. On the agenda today with this guy, going to Dimanyat Islands, right here off the coast of Oman. Do a little snorkeling, boating, checking that part of the, the countryside since we've gone into the mountains. All right, hot day, we finally found it. We went around in circles. First, we struggled trying to find coffee, because if there's one thing you'll know about Oman is that Dubai spoils you with coffee everywhere. Here, you go to like these local coffee shops which are really 
sadly not that We're gonna good. go in, some black tip sharks. Harmless apparently, but I'm gonna pretend that they're really vicious. We also got some stingrays potentially we're gonna try to see, and I didn't bring my GoPro. I don't know, we saw some turtles, so you can see over there, really, really cool. Just like the area, really, really nice places right next to these islands. And what are the island's name again? This island named it Black Tip Shark. Yeah, they name. Ah, there you go. Name the island after what you can see, so let's hope we get to see them. Yeah. What do we got behind us, bro? This is the Opera House. Alright. The ROM. The ROM. And they built it in 2011. We got a really cool tour to kind of see it and check it out. What's amazing about the Opera House is that it blends Omani heritage with contemporary design with no expense spared. It has a capacity of about 1,100 people and state-of-the-art technology that captures sound like you would never believe. This is not the first time I had visited Oman before. I was here in 2017, 2019, and again now. I love Oman. The mountains, oceans, culture, food, hospitality make it one of the most beautiful and enchanting, magical and authentic, and welcoming countries in the entire region. I know I'll be back again soon. Mexico City is one of the largest metropolises in the world, but it also boasts the most museums in Latin America, incredible cuisine, and seemingly endless number of parks for city dwellers. On this journey, we're in the incredible city of Mexico City, one of the biggest populations in the world. And we're gonna see the four faces of Mexico City, the culture, the history, the nature, and the modernity of this incredible city. So let's check it out and see what it has on offer. You can see all the different architectural styles right here in the center of Mexico City. You got Art Deco over there, you got probably buildings from the 60s and 70s all up here. And then if you turn around and you see this, this is an amazing building. It's called the Palacio de Bel Artes, which is like the Palace of, of Fine Art. And what we're really going to investigate into, which is really going to be fun to see, is Diego Rivera's murals. And he's done them all over the city, especially here. So let's go check it out. It was finished in 1934, started in 1904, had a major delay, but I think it's going to be a beautiful building. So this is one of the main thoroughfares right in the heart of the city, from one part of the uh, older part of the town where we were at in the, in the Palace of Fine Arts, and going straight into what is going to be the center of Mexico City. And right through there's just tons of people out and about. Obviously it's coming into a weekend, but absolutely gorgeous. Just so bustling and lively. So this is Chapultepec Park, right here in Mexico City, where there's like botanical gardens, museums, a castle, all kinds of stuff, and it's so awesome. About 1,700 acres, right smack in the middle of the city. Great way to see it on a bike. You can rent them for the day almost anywhere. People are doing yoga, exercising, selling stuff, all kinds of really cool things. And it's just kind of like speaks to the nature of how incredible uh, Mexico City is and how varied it is. And this is really the natural side of it. So while London has Hyde Park and New York has Central Park, this is Mexico City's main natural park. Now as part of the modern aspect of Mexico City, check out that library. Unbelievable. To get a feel for the modernity of Mexico City, we went to visit the Vesconcelos Library. It was inaugurated in 2006 with the idea that it would be built like an ark, a container of human knowledge. It has over 600,000 books that are accessible to the public. Look, it's such an amazing place just to study and sit and read a book. But I have to say, the architectural style alone is truly the main draw of the library and makes it super worth visiting when you come to Mexico City. Mexico City was everything we expected and more. In reality, it has far more than four faces. It's really a city of many contrasts, from its rich history to its glamorous nightlife, its numerous quaint parks to its skyscrapers, the juxtaposition of ancient Mayan to Catholic religious practices, and the contrast of historic and modern architecture, and of course, the culture and food that makes this place so incredible and worthy of many return visits in the future. Papua New Guinea is said to be one of the most ecological and linguistic diverse countries in the world. The natural beauty of this country knows no bounds and is a must visit. But I was also taken by some of the unique cultural habits, including the pervasive use of betel nut. On this adventure, we're in the incredible island country of Papua New Guinea, right here in the South Pacific. 
So let's go check out what this incredible island country has on offer. So for rugby you. is the favorite sport here in Papua New Guinea. That's, That's the lime. That's the lime powder. Yeah. Lime powder. You dip the mustard inside it. And then how long do you chew? And then. Um, Thirty minutes. Awesome. Makes you hyper. Makes you hyper. Yeah. Energized. <laughs> cool. I'm with here with Nara, who's kind of like. Wow. Can you even hear that? That is crazy. Deafening. <sighs> Almost freaky. So one of the things you're gonna figure out in Papua New Guinea, it is no joke to try to find cars, taxis and stuff like that. People that are not chewing beer on that, people are not drunk, people that are focused, that speak English and that know the terrain well. And it's been hard. But thankfully, thankfully, I think I found a guy who takes an off-road vehicle to get there. In Matu, yeah. uh, you will, in morning, you will say Daba Namunai. And then in, uh, in, in Fijin? Uh, Fijin and uh... Just as uh, morning only. Morning. morning only. Yeah, morning. Same, same. <laughs> and for my for my my, my language, I'm uh, Ribarago. Ribarago. I think I found a guy. He's got this cool car. Um, they're telling me it takes an off-road vehicle to get there. So they did say use an off-road vehicle to take this road because it's about 17 kilometers away from asphalt to get to Orr's Corner. So hopefully this new tire we have, thank God the guy had it in the back of the car, will get us to our destination. Here we go. You're a machine, Jason. All right, so here's the Kokata Trail. This is kind of where it all starts, and you go out for about nine days trekking way up into those mountains over there, as you guys will see. Just so lush and, and hard. It's a hard, hard terrain. All right, this is why my guide, intrepid guide who's done this many, many, many times for many years. And so for, for many people, it's a special trail. Yes. Because of the hardships that will happen yes. and so yes. forth. Yes. When the dry season, it's okay. Yeah. But when the uh, when the wet season, it's pretty hard. You, you gotta you gotta climb up, go down, yeah. up, down, yeah. and some parts are really hard to cross. It turns out that you have to climb up and down about 5,000 meters in a matter of 10 days. So there's a lot of climbing. Hopefully, we're not doing that. We're just gonna take it easy. We're just gonna see parts of the trail, do a little bit of climbing, but nothing that crazy. So I don't have to tire our friend Y when we do this. All right, let's do it. So am I the first Iraqi you've ever met? Mm, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Good. My first time to see Iraqi. Iraqi. Iraq. Okay, yeah. there you go. I'll try to be a good ambassador for you. Okay. How awesome is that? You see, our job is to always be good ambassadors for our countries, wherever we travel to. Because oftentimes you won't find your people everywhere in the world. So you always want to be a good ambassador. So people like Y will always remember us as good, strong people. So far, so good. So far, so good. We got this, we got this Y. I'm parched. I think I've only had a liter of water with me on the whole trek. It's about 82 degrees outside, hotter than hell, and you're going up and down ridges. I am dying. It is said that Papua New Guinea is on the top 10 list of the most beautiful countries in the world as ranked by Forbes. And while my time was limited and I couldn't venture too far, I did get a glimpse of its incredible beauty. Likely the highlight of my travels in 2023 was my training and eventual participation in the 70.3 Ironman in the beautiful city of Melbourne, Australia. I had to dig deep to keep training despite injuries and stay mentally strong in the face of so many challenges. All right, today, marks the first day of training for a six month training regime to undertake something I've been wanting to do for a very, very long time, which is a half Ironman. Right here in Long Beach with my crazy trainer, Tim, show him the camera. What's up this guys? This guy has made the difference. Everything was going well until I kind of peaked. All right, so I've been feeling 
chronic elbow pain, um, probably years of exercising, tendonitis, and it just kind of got aggravated. Uh, I think going through the swimming and the training and I got a PRP treatment on my elbow. So hopefully that will get me back on track so I can get back into the pool and start swimming again. But man, was that odd and painful. I got so upset at myself because I was just not hitting the marks and I was like, man, I was going so well for so long. Um, and then everything just started to slow down. I found a chance to do something far bigger than myself. So some of you may know that for the last five months, I've been training really, really hard for the half Ironman, which is gonna be happening in Melbourne, Australia on November 12th. And so I wanna do it for a purpose. And right now there's a very, very important purpose that I want you to really think about and consider and to donate to, which is the children in the region, in the Middle East region, in Palestine and so forth that are really suffering from this humanitarian. And so I decided that I would raise money for the children there. And there were so many that were being That's suddenly, somehow just started to motivate me and inspire me. And I just suddenly, as each donation started coming in, I started getting more and more amped and more and more pumped and more and more ready for this. Somehow it just got me so excited, like so excited for uh, the event and to make it happen. Finally, uh, I board my flight from Los Angeles. I arrived on Thursday. That first day, I wanted to stay up and not fall asleep halfway through the day. So I literally decided to walk all across Melbourne. Um, I think I walked that day like 10 or 12 miles. And there's just so much to explore. So it's the day before the race. What better way to kind of calm the nerves than going through the botanical gardens right here in the heart of Melbourne. Feeling a little bit under the weather. I'm a little bit weak. I don't know if it's anxiety or if I'm actually coming down with something. Um, I don't know why, but this uh, the race definitely has me nervous. Less so this guy. He just <laughs> Final preparations for the big day. I'm gonna try to get to bed early. It's around eight-ish right now. I'm super nervous. I'm gonna try to do the best I can. Um, I got everything prepared. Try to get to bed early. Get ready for the big day tomorrow. It's about 4.45 a.m. right now. We've got about an hour to set everything up and then the swim times are gonna start releasing at six o'clock all the way through 6.15. And then after that, it's gonna be nonstop to the bitter end. Let's make this happen. <laughs> I say that and the first thing that happens is we get to the course line or we get there and they're like, hey, announcement. The water is so choppy from the winds from yesterday, from the day before and into that morning that we have to cut the swim by half because it's too dangerous, which was good news because the swim was gonna be less, but it was bad news too because it was gonna be super choppy and can throw you off. So as I sat there um, waiting to jump into this crazy ocean with crazy waves and just trying to pump myself up and psych myself up, I just kept on remembering that motto. When your legs get tired, run with your heart. Legs get tired, run with your heart. Just keep going, just keep going, keep going. And remember, you're doing this for something so much bigger, so much bigger than you. And you can't stop. Don't stop. And it begins. Boom, we're running into the water. And the first wave we go up, bam! Second wave, bam! Third wave. I swear to you, I'm getting seasick. I'm thinking I'm gonna get disqualified because I'm about to jump and hold on to the buoy because things are so choppy. It felt like I was going into war. And then boom, I hit the beach. I hit the beach. I'm like, I can't believe it. And I just start going. And I just start screaming at people as I'm running through the transition. Well, let's go, let's go, we got I this. I get into that position and I just start gunning it and going as fast as I possibly could, trying to remember where there's gonna be little hills, where there's gonna be the difficulty, where are there gonna be the tighter bends and so forth. I go on the second loop and I'm going, I'm going and I see my friends and I swear to you, I'm yelling at the top of my lungs, let's do this. I got into the transition area, quickly got into my running shoes, got everything ready and just started running. Ah, oh, what a feeling. And one foot in front of the other and I'm like, come on, you can do it, don't overcommit but be kind to yourself, just kind of go through this thing. I saw my friends again. We kept motivating and, and inspiring each other and then we got to that last bit and that Colombian friend of mine had finished an hour early. Oh my God, I remember, I don't know what got into me, but um, I just, I got to that last 200 meters. I looked at that line and I'm just like, this is it. This is it. And I just, 
punch it. I just run as fast as I could, as soon as I hit that carpet, as fast as I had in me. Did it! Amazing yeah, experience. Wait, Look at the. Hold on, I'm holding it backwards. <laughs> right there, baby. And we crushed it with this guy. Unbelievable. Yeah. What an experience. Lost my voice, screaming my ass off. And I remember this is it. This is the medal that I got. And that's, that's the quote. I'll never forget it. When, you, when your legs get tired, run with your heart. And it was just so inspiring. I hope this video motivated you to explore the world and discover the infinite stories that are waiting to be told. And please don't forget to subscribe so you could be the first to get the latest content that will help you learn more about some of the most remote places on earth. Thank you for watching. Stay curious. And I look forward to seeing you on my journeys in 2024.